The Focus of Freedom, from the Freedom Tabernacle Baptist Church and Freedom Tabernacle Ministries in Atkins, Virginia. Home of Camp Freedom, a regional outreach to our youth. Freedom House, offering counseling, intervention, emergency shelter, and food distribution. And with our many missionary partners, reaching out around the world with the light and love of the gospel of Christ. And now, the focus of freedom. So upon the infallible, eternal, undeniable word of God I stand. Us here at Freedom, to all of you, we pray you had a wondrously blessed Easter, celebrating the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, who said in Revelation 1, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. So blessed, happy Easter as we close it out sort of together here on the Focus of Freedom tonight. So glad you're here now. Being recorded in advance, that means I don't know how things have gone this week as we've gone through the end of the week. I know what the prognosticators were saying. The death toll was going to shoot sky high and everybody was just going to be scared to death. Well, you can believe that if you want to, but I know different. I know we're on our way to heaven. I know God already told me that there was going to be fearful sights, pestilences, uh, rumors of wars, all kinds of situations that would wreak havoc in the minds of people for people's hearts would be filled with fear looking after the events that were going on globally. And that's, that's it's just a part of it. Could be a prelude uh, to the worst things that are to come. Now, a lot of people say, don't talk about that preacher. Well, we're all going to die. It's appointed unto all of us once to die. And uh, we'll mention in the message here tonight that there's going to be uh, objects falling from above, little microscopic rascals uh, crawling that no man can even see. So there's no going to be a place to hide. I don't mean to bust the bubble of the preppers, but you've got to have an air vent down in your bunker. Well, how are you going to guard against the, uh, the microscopic uh, viruses or bacteria? Uh, how are you going to do that? Uh, you'll run to the rocks and mountains in that day and they'll say no hiding place. There's there's no place to hide from him that sits upon the throne. The loving lamb who now in his prophetic scheme, the grace event is in the grace day comes to an end and the great day of his wrath is come. That's why we cry to take God's mercy, to look heavenward. Now you can mock and say that religion is, is just sick and we don't want nothing to do it. You have that prerogative and nobody's going to bother you. But one day we're all going to die. And after this, the judgment. So as far as God's people, what's our responsibility in this? Since World War II, the church has been so divided, uh, splitting, fussing, uh, not liking this, not liking that, being so fat and blessed physically that we've got into such a normalcy of criticism. Well, I don't like that music. I like this music. I don't like the way they dress. I don't like where they let their church folks go. And now we've got all kinds of churches, all kinds of denominations that has put baskets uh, over the light. And then individually, we've stuck the light under the bed. So we've got our comfort zone. We've got denominational dogma. Jesus, he's the light. He lives in us as his people, making us the light of the world. And he put us in the church on the candlestick so that we would be warm and welcoming. And the world would see from the darkness that they're lost in, the beauty and the grace and the mercy of the Lord Jesus, who is the true light that saved us and blesses our lives so he could save them and bless their lives. But the devil wants to, us to give occasion for the world to mock. So they look at us expecting to see Jesus, which that's the way Jesus wants it. He said, shine the light so they in darkness can see light. That's the purpose. So the devil takes that truth and he twists it. And he tells the world, look at Jesus, look at Jesus. Look at them, how they fuss at one another and stand against one another. And look how they live their lives. So the devil takes a truth, twists that truth, and uses it for his glory. And his glory is keeping people lost and getting them to die lost. 
The purpose of Christ is to save people and get them to die saved. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So beloved brethren and sisters, let's reevaluate and repent. We've been doing our thing and now look at the world and the condition of the world. Let's humble, let's pray, let's seek his face, turn from our wicked ways so that the world then would have a clearer picture of him because Jesus would take note of that from heaven and forgive our sin and heal our land. We love you on this Easter, but we've got to be honestly humble and say if we had been more in tune with the word and the will of God, Instead of our own bushels and our own beds, perhaps the light would have been shining brighter that more people would have been saved. I wonder how many of these, what, nearly 8,000 have died as of today, I think. How many of them were saved? How many of them were ready for eternity? Because once we die, whether it be from COVID-19, accident, tragedy, heart attack, cancer, whatever, old age, whatever, when we die, we're going to face God. And Jesus came, born of the virgin, and he is love. He died so we could live. He suffered for us, mutilated and, and agonized. But then he arose, having conquered death, hell, and the grave, sin, and Satan. And because he lives, we can too. Eternally in the heaven, thank God, hasten that day. Lord, I'm ready to go, ain't you? But we've got a purpose before our death is to live abundantly on earth before we live eternally in heaven. And we can do that as the light of the world and the salt of the earth. May the resurrection of Christ bring all the joy and the power and the peace and the purpose that each of us individually needs and each of us then collectively with each other as the church show forth moving forward that the world would see him and when he's lifted up, he'll draw all people unto him. May God have mercy upon you that are worried, uh, you that may be going through quite a bit of stress as a result of, of this virus. Look to the Lord. Uh, don't sit down and, and just be overcome of this evil, but overcome this evil with good. Watch out for your neighbors. If you have elderly family members, families, take care of families. Uh, make sure that you're taking care of yourself by being thankful unto the Lord, praying, seeking his face, searching his scripture, relaxing your mind once in a while, like Jesus said, come aside and let's rest a while. So do positive things, blessed things. And one of the greatest ways to be blessed is to be a blessing to someone else. God bless you. We're all ministers now. We have been and we will continue to be. So may this Easter just give us a, place of ease and settlement and let's forget those things which are behind and reach forth unto those things which are before and I pray that God will use tonight's focus of freedom to be a real blessing to you you're going to listen to a group that's sort of unknown in this region I know they sang for D.R. Harrison down in the tent meeting in Greenville and they've been around, I think, the Morristown area and maybe the Rogersville area. Talking about Brother Todd Allen and his precious family. Uh, they've been with us here this week. And jump on Facebook, Freedom Tabernacle Ministries. You can see the replays of the Global Awakening and all the other things that we do there on the Facebook page. We invite you to come by our website, ftministries.org, and keep up with all that's going on here at Freedom. And we love you. We appreciate you so very much, and we just pray that God will use this week's edition of the Focus of Freedom to be a real source of encouragement and peace and grounding in all of our lives here tonight. I want to thank Jesus for the plan of Just to say, Lord, I love you, for you understand, I want to be there, Lord, that great trust that for me, to touch.
2 Kings 6 and 7 is very, very dire. There is a heart excruciating situation and circumstance going on. We'll get into that just a little bit later. But the, the prophet says, this time tomorrow, fine flour and two measures of barley are going to be sold for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. That's the word of the Lord. And every preacher, every singer, every child of God, when the light of the world, the Lord Jesus, established residency in our lives, when we as repentant sinners trusted in the grace of Almighty God and we were born into the family of God, the light of Christ is in us now making us the light of the world. That's why he said in the Sermon on the Mount, talking to us Christians, you're the light of the world and you're the salt of the earth. I didn't save you to let some organized denominational basket cover you. I didn't save you for you to put yourself underneath your bed. I'm talking the words of Jesus. A lot of times religious people will throw a a religious basket over us. A lot of times we ourselves will get comfortable in our bed and we'll put the true purpose that Christ has for us underneath the bed and that light then becomes dim and really not capable of meeting the divine intent that Christ had when he saved our souls for us to go into all the world, preach the gospel. So please don't let a bushel or a bed cover you. Christ saved you from your sin. When he did, he established you in a particular individual socket in this golden candelabra of his church and he lit you up with his mercy, his grace. Your body now is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you and now you are saved, you're secure and you've been sent into all the world as the light of the world. That's who we are as God's people. So we have faith, we have hope. We have love and no situation can get so dire or destructive to take away that divine intent and purpose for our lives. So Elijah says, this time tomorrow, (laughs) there's going to be plenty. There was a raging family, a famine. We'll get to that in a second. But before we do, now let's go from the prophet to the politician. (laughs) Can we do that? Verse 2. The Lord on whose hand the king leaned. Now this is a political cat. I mean, he's got a position in the, in, in, in the government. And a lot of people will trust science. A lot of people will trust t- technology. A lot of people, believe it or not, will trust politicians and philosophy. It's Proverbs 14, 11, I think, and it's repeated two or three times in Proverbs. Yes, there is a way that sincerely actually seems right to a human spirit, to an individual. But the end thereof are the ways of death. I could stand here on God's platform this morning and rehearse in all of our ears countless times how that people really are persuaded that they're going in the right direction. And yet it's all based on a lie and based on the foundation of the objective of Satan for this world. And it may sound good and we may think, oh, we're going to get rid of God and we're going to do all this. Well, you never get rid of God to start with. But the, the, the attempt to replace God has been in place in human society ever since Cain. So with all that said, look at the politician now. He sort of scoffs. And he says, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this be? Can you hear a little sarcastic Doubt. Doubt is the enemy of faith. Don't doubt, believe. And we don't march to the drumbeat of this world. We stand on this right here. This precious family that just ministered. And I'm telling you, they sung me happy over there a minute ago. I just, 
I told one of the young men, I said, I wish this place was filled with people. We'd be a praising God, shouting, running aisles. We will be one of these days. But where two or three are gathered, he's in the midst. And the Allens are over here. We got a couple of ushers back there. We got some sound folks. We're trying to be compliant with the governor's uh, executive order. But I don't know how many people's with us this morning. But I hope you can feel what we're feeling here in God's house, right there in your house. And you can. Are you going to listen to the prophet, to the word of God, or some politician and the ideology of man? As for me, I want to believe God and stand on this book right here. So the man of God says to this politician, well, you're going to see it with your eyes, but you're not going to eat of it. Now, how about that? We don't have to be intimidated by the ideologies of this world. We as God's people, we want to be theologically correct, not politically correct. So don't let what you're hearing out here in this world manipulate you emotionally. Quoted it thousands of times, Proverbs 23, 7, as we think in our heart, so are we. To be spiritually minded in accordance with Philippians 2 gives you a strong sense of emotional well-being. And the inner fruit of the Spirit is active in your life. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. All these wonderful attributes that are indicative of the character of Christ within us in the indwelling Holy Spirit that will inevitably then produce the conduct of Christ. Perfect love casts out fear, 1 John chapter 4. 2 Timothy 1, 7, God's not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So we line up with the Word of God. Hey, feller, you're going to, you might see it, but you ain't going to eat of it and enjoy it because we know the Word of God is true and, let, and the Holy Spirit is true and every human spirit is a lie because the human spirit is tied to this world but the Holy Spirit is in conjunction in unity with this Word right here. And it's the Word of God that's truth and Jesus prayed in the intercessory prayer, Thy Word is truth, sanctify Our people, the believers, Jesus said, sanctify them by thy word. Thy word is truth. So here's the truth of the word of God on this topic this time tomorrow. You've got crying, crying. And that's in chapter 6, verse 24 and 25. The Syrians gathered his host, King Abinadad, besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria. And behold, I don't, it, it hurts my heart to read this verse. A donkey's head was selling for four score pieces of silver. A little fragment of dove's dung was selling for a great price. We know the prophecies of God are sure. And we know that the great day of God's wrath is coming. And God who is holy cannot look upon sin. And the loving God is still holy. And when we go our own way and do our own thing, inevitably we're going to self-destruct. Now, Elijah, Elijah the man of God was able to get a grand victory over the Syrians in Dothan right here in chapter 6. You know that story. Abinadad was fearful that he had a spy or something in his inner hierarchy of his military. And finally, when he was investigating all that, somebody said, listen, you don't have a spy. It's that man of God down in Israel. He's telling the Jehoram everything that you're thinking. And what you whisper to your wife in bed at night, that man of God immediately tells it to the king of Israel. We, I said, where is she? He's down in Dothan. So Ben and Dad said, go fetch him. So they sent a host to Dothan, come past the city about. In the morning, the little servant of Elijah got up, went out and surveyed around the mountains of Dothan, and he almost had a heart attack. He went back in there, scared to death, told Elijah, said, oh, master, they're come after us. And this mighty host, what in the world are we going to do? 
And there the man of God might have been having his morning coffee. He had his teacup, <laughs> coffee cup. And if you'd look at the surface of that coffee, there wasn't a wrinkle in it. He wasn't nervous at all. He wasn't intimidated at all. Puts his little coffee cup down in the saucer, pats the aid there on top of the head, looks up to God and said, God, how about opening this young man's eyes? <laughs> Oh, I would to God, God would open our eyes this morning where we could see beyond the enemy and out flanking around the perimeter of the enemy. There were fiery chariots and the horsemen thereof and the angels of God. And the little feller said, why? They that are for us are more than they that be against us. Can I tell you, greater is he that's in you than he that is in this world. You don't have, I'm telling you, this time tomorrow, there's hope. And don't you ever lose hope. Don't you ever be overcome of evil. You can overcome evil with good. So the Lord smote them all with blindness. Elijah takes them back to Samaria, leads them back. Old Jehoram, the son of Ahab, sitting on the throne, calls him with respect. He said, Father Elijah, what am I going to do? You want me to slay them? And Elijah said, would you dare take prisoners of war? Would you dare be? We're good even to those that are evil against us. You feed them well. You sustain them well. And let's, let's release them. You would think that if you're good to somebody, they'd be good to you. But that ain't always the case. Jesus said in Mark 6, sometimes your enemies will be those of your own household. So a twofold thing here develops. Benedict, it wasn't long till he returned the favor, all right. He brought the Bible. You can look at it in your Bible. He brought all of his host. Now, biblical history, scholars, all that, some estimates say maybe 176,000 soldiers showed up. But there was a mighty, mighty host, and they totally sealed in the capital of Israel, Samaria. Nobody could get out. Nobody could get in. So don't expect this world to be good to you this world is hostile to all of us because it is cursed by sin. God told Adam, when you disobey me, you'll die. The devil said, you won't die. Well, we found out we've had troubles and trials ever since Adam's transgression. And the consequential result, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So the greatest thing that I could do or you could do, and it's, if you're not saved, I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to do what the 477 did this week. You need to join that number and get born again and get saved by the grace of Almighty God because the devil wants you in hell. And this world whose God, who's God is the devil, that's in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, you can find it, the God of this world. He will blind your eyes and bind your mind. And so Abinadad, he decided he would seize the city, torment God's people, and eventually overrun, ransack the city, and destroy them all. There was your politician, and there was your leader. Now look at Jehoram, the king. For some odd reason, and this baffles me, and it baffles most preachers. Why in the world would the king of Israel who had just a, a short time prior referred to the man of God as, Oh, my father. Now he says in bitterness and in anger and hostile in intent, Tomorrow my word is I will decapitate Elijah. I'll kill him. Why? He was so emotionally distraught because of his improper thought and his carnal thinking that when he heard the crying you can read it for yourself this morning they had been reduced down to cannibalism a whole lot worse than today they didn't have anything to eat they only had five horses left and all the armed forces there in Samaria. And the king was walking along the wall. And there was a lady down below. 
And she was saying, oh, help, help. And he said, if God can't help you, how can I help you? But then he turned back around and said, what's your problem? The Bible is so honest with just how far down sin and pride and rebellion will take you without God. And that dear broken-hearted mother said, it's hard to believe how much evil can be in the world and the bottomless pit of sin, how far the devil will take you down. He's a liar, he's a thief, and he's a murderer. And that dear mother said yesterday, we consumed my little boy. We were so hungry. And my friend said today, we do the same with her son. But she's ran off. And I can't find her or her boy. Did I kill my child needlessly? Why did I do that? I'd have rather starved. That's what the devil will do. The devil will tell you that drug or that sex or that promiscuity or that thirst for money and power and control will satisfy you. But there ain't nothing going to satisfy you other than God. Because sin separated us from God. And looking everywhere else, it's just dissatisfaction and emptiness and bottomless pits. But when you return to God through the cross, you'll find everything you need in Him. So there was the crying. Next, there was the dying. But then, thirdly, there was some trying. (laughs) Boy, chapter 7, verse 9. Let's go ahead and read what was going to be our text. I think we've got time to do that. But verse 3, 4, and 5, and then we'll look at verse 9. There were four leprous men at the entering end of the gate. (laughs) And they said one to another, Why sit we here? Until we die. Pastor, don't let your your congregation die. Brother, sister, don't let your spiritual power die. Yes, there there was crying and dying. But let's look at this trying here. Got to get on down to verse 5. Look what these four old leprous men. Now, they, they weren't in the city. And they weren't out there with the Syrians either. They were just in the middle. If you will, this was an actual one of many cases in the Bible of quarantine. They were lepers. They were banished from interaction in society. And there are four of them were. Four, I believe I mentioned this in brief passing just a a week or two ago. It's the number of this world. The directions, the seasons. It's what four represents. We're in the world, the light of the world, but we're not of the world. Because Jesus saved us and got us out of the world. Washed us with his blood, filled us with his spirit, sealed us with his spirit. And then as his people, he who saved us out of the world and separated us from the world, (laughs) sent us right back into the world. So here they are sitting at the gate. And they said to one another, why sit we here till we die? If we enter into the city, the famine's in the city and we'll die there. And if we sit here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us fall under the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we'll live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. (laughs) So if we're going to sit here, we're going to die. If we go over here, we're going to die. And if we go over there, who knows? Some of us have been sitting around in criticism and judgmental attitudes. Then we get over here in pride and self-control. We're going to die here, we're going to die here, so we might as well go there. (laughs) Because over there is something different. Jesus wants you to grow. Jesus wants you to glow. Jesus wants you to go. Now, look at verse 5. They rose up in the twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And they went. Look at that in verse 5 in your Bibles. 
They rose up in the twilight. In John 9, 4, Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. This COVID-19 should be a wake-up call to everybody. Don't base your hope on this world. This world, according to John 2.15, is passing away. And everything in it. But he that does the will of God abides forever. So as the sun was going down, get that. I've got it underlined there on your graphic. The night's coming, Jesus said. No man's going to be able to work. Paul said we've got to redeem the time. Our lives, according to James, just a vapor that appears for a little while. And yes, Jesus is coming, but yes, also, I'm going. We've spent now, what, 45 years plus here in this particular ministry. And it's went by just like the Bible says, just like a vapor. So what we've got to do, we've got to do it now. And faith without works is dead. And so here God uses the most unlikely to attempt what was certainly unlikely for everybody else to do. King Jehoram wasn't about to go over there and face the enemy. The generals in the hierarchy of the military wasn't willing to go. But here these four guys scratches their head and figures it out. Well, we're dead anyhow. (laughs) We're dead in trespasses and sins. I don't know about you, but according to Galatians 2.20, I died with Christ on that cross, but then I came alive through the resurrection power. I was dead in trespasses and sins. Now I'm dead to trespasses and sins, and I've got life eternal in heaven through him, and I've got life abundant on this earth with him. Oh, he's your partner in Uganda. He's your partner when you're singing. He's singing with you. It's the unction of the Holy Spirit of the living God. And so now we go from trying to thriving in verse 9. Oh, they said one to another, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings. When they went to the very uttermost part of that camp, when they started walking, God Almighty started talking. I mean, God's looking for some legs to your prayers. God's looking for some participation in the partnership. He's done all he can do. Now he's looking for us to do what little bit we can do. And little is much when God's in it. God was just looking for somebody not to have talking faith, but walking faith. It's like James said, you show me your faith without your works, I'll show you mine by my works. So here they went. And they got over there. They, did, they, didn't, they didn't run into any sentries. They didn't run into any guards. <laughs> no checkpoints. And they got smelling something. Can you imagine that mess sergeant's uh, uh, staff in that tent that was responsible for feeding tens of thousands of young soldiers. I don't know what was on the menu that day, but it sure beat a few pieces of dub dung. (laughs) Hallelujah! You don't have to be picking around like a hog. You're a lamb. You can eat from the manger, the bread of heaven. You'll never thirst. You'll never hunger again. And the water of life, you'll never thirst again. It's like Jesus told that blessed old gal there in John 4 at the well of Jacob's well in Sychar. Drink this water around here. You will surely thirst again. But if you'll drink the water I'll give you, it'll be in you a well springing up into everlasting life. Give me a drink. He said, call your husband. She said, I don't have one. He said, ain't you answered right? You ain't got one. You've had five and that cat you're living with now. Ain't your husband. But she dropped that water pot and went from being a prostitute to a preacher. She said, I don't believe in women preachers. You tell me that woman there in John 4 wouldn't preach it. She went back down to everybody she had known before and said, look at me now. I'm different instantaneously. She didn't have to prove herself to the governmental board of the hierarchy of the church. She didn't have to do all that stuff. She immediately became an evangelist. Come see a man told me everything that I'd ever done. Is not this the Christ? And the whole town was turned upside down. Those boys got out there and walked in that mess tent. Gracious. They filled up. God Almighty knows the beginning from the ending. He made them all. All the officers had all kinds of clothes. 
They had brought even money and jewelry. And those four guys were in a place of of abundance. They went from a position of dire need and death to a place of absolute supply and life. That's what God will do to you if you're lost and you'll be saved today. And He'll do the same thing for us as God's people if we will allow God to take absolute control and charge of our lives. They did what a lot of us do. They hid that stuff. They went to another tent, got all they could do, and hid that. And then it dawned on them. In the middle of the night here, and we got such good tidings. One of them probably said, well, wait till the morning. (laughs) I said, we can't wait. So they went back across no man's land. And the porter of the city, the guard up there above the gate, And one of the old lepers said, Hey, wake the town, tell the king and everybody. It's all they can ever eat just right over the way here. (laughs) You're nuts. Y'all go back to sleep. You're dehydrated. You're that far from starving to death. You're hallucinating. (laughs) You know, some people think we're crazy. This old world might think, oh, you old-time Christians. We've been to the cross and we're headed to the city. And now we've got compassion. We care about you. And we're not going to make you get saved because we don't have that power. But we can preach the cross and there's power in that cross to make you realize your condition. So they woke the king. Here comes old Jehoram. And he says, ah, you boys are mistaken. You're not as prowess. As I, for I was trained by my dad. Elijah said, that liar. <laughs> this is nothing more than an ambush. They've set you all up. You've come back here, and you're just going to lead us to our death. That's all. There's one of those politicians for you. But the prophet said, for a shekel of silver, <laughs> there will be a measure of fine flour and barley in the gate of Samaria this time tomorrow. So he got his counselors and people together right quick. And he said, we only have five horses. We'll let you have two chariot horses. Give me some volunteers. Somebody go out and check it. You'll probably die, but we'll at least flush them out. So here they get on those two chariot horses, and here they go. (laughs) They weren't harassed all through the camp. And then as the sun came up tomorrow, they saw a path that led them all the way down to the Jordan. Garments, weaponry. Because when those guys started, God Almighty started. And they heard, and that's what they, they heard the sound. They thought it was the Hittites and the Egyptians. They thought somehow or another uh, Jehoram had hired mercenaries by the endless numbers to come and assault them and save Samaria. That's what they thought. You know, the, the world, your daddy, the devil's a liar, he's lying to everybody. And sometimes, though, God can take the methodology of the world and turn it around for His glory. As a matter of fact, God can take any bad situation and turn it around for His honor and for His glory. And so they tra- they traced and tracked that all the way to the Jordan. Then it started north into Syria. They left all kinds of stuff behind. So they came back and said to the king, doubtless something mighty has happened here. You want to cry? You want to die? Or do you want to try and then thrive. That's you. That's the, the answer's yours. Are you going to be like the politicians and say, this is an ambush. We've got to do our thing. Do you want to say, well, if God opens up and wins the heaven, maybe this will be man of God. This ain't going to happen. So Elijah said, this time tomorrow, <laughs> you watch it. And what you meant sarcastically, God surely can fling open the windows of heaven. And like Malachi says, pour us out a blessing that we're not even able to contain. It was Leviticus 26, I think it said, five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will chase 10,000. 
That was in the recognition of the Lamb. But in the rehearsal of the law in Deuteronomy chapter 30, it went down to one of you chase a thousand and two of you will chase 10,000. Because when God moves, little David didn't go down into that valley for the victory, as I've said many times. He went down there with the victory. Hebrews chapter 11 talks about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, Samson, Deborah, all of those heroes through faith, by faith, in faith. They stopped the mouths of lions and they turned to flight approaching armies. Four leprous men started walking and God joined them in partnership and started talking. The thunder of this book makes Satan tremble. Beelzebub and the principalities and the rulers of darkness speak in whispers and walk on tiptoes for they are subject unto our God. And when that old mess sergeant heard that thunder and then God even made the earth tremble. And they said, my goodness, what are we going to do? And fear fell upon the enemy. For they could feel the rumbling beneath their feet. They thought they were surrounded on all sides. So God gave them one little doorway there. They like to broke their neck running. They throwed everything down. All the way back to Damascus, Syria. And now the people of God with rejoicing, they go out and get all that stuff. See, like in Jehoshaphat's day, when the devil comes after your stuff, God will slap him down and give you his spoil. That's what God does. Whatever's going on dire in Uganda, God's going to bless. We've got eternal life in glory forever. And we've got abundant life here and now. So we don't have to be intimidated. And there they brought all that stuff And then that blessed politician, I do feel sorry for him. These are the days of Lot. These are the days of Noah, Luke 17. We know as God's people where we're going and we know what our calling is now. So we have faith, not fear. They're trying to stir the pot in fear today. Politicians and people with self-serving agendas and all the rest of it. But we do not march to the drumbeat of this world. We are the sheep of our shepherd and we're following him. And we are fishers of men. So just out below the gate there, there was four old leprous men grinning from ear to ear. And the man of God now approaches and Jehoram doesn't lift a finger. But he had a great attitude adjustment. And now steps up the politician that scoffed and said, this ain't going to happen. And when all the population heard it, they got excited more so than the enemy. For at least the enemy had been dining and whining and, you know, during the siege. But God ran them off with a great uh, uh, terrorizing uh, stampede. They all ran. And now God's people are hearing. There's plenty. God's turned it around. We don't have to try to find some little dove droppings. There's everything we could ever eat and everything we could ever know. And it's out in the gate and even beyond the gate. I'm telling you, he does exceedingly, Ephesians 3.20, God's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think. And a little politician was standing there and he saw that crowd come in. I mean, tell you, it was a rush. He said, y'all, calm down. Don't get so emotional. Hold on here. They ran over him. And I hate that he died, but I think that was metaphoric. I don't believe God wants us to run over anybody, 
But I believe it showed him and everybody else that God's God and he always will be God. Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. He can bring he can break springs in high places and open rivers in the desert. God will supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Amen. So you go the wrong way, you're gonna get run over. <laughs> So everybody that doubts, everybody that pouts, everybody's got those bushels on your lights. Everybody's got your light on the bed. Get it out from under the bed. Get the bushel off of it. I'm calling on every pastor in America. Love me. Let me love you. Let's stop this crazy, divisive, divisive stuff. And let's get together in unity. And one of these days, God's going to shoo this, uh, this uh, old stuff out of here. And we can go greater and stronger than we've ever been in God. This time tomorrow, will you believe God with me? The urgency of it is, if you think this is bad, dear listener or viewer, like we preached a few weeks ago, the promised elimination of planet Earth. Those big asteroids that Jimmy saw in that helicopter the other clear night with his night goggles on, and he saw that thing bust into three pieces, and he said, scared him, he thought it was going to hit the Earth. It's coming. What are you going to do when God rains the brimstone? What are you going to do when what John saw on Patmos comes to fruition? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that just as you moved mightily in the lives of those precious four leprous men who dared believe that something would be better if they took a walk out through no man's land. God, help us to get beyond ourselves. Help us, God, to get out of the ruts and the selfishness, and the pride, and the disobedience. You tell us to love one another. Been very little of that in your church the last quarter of a century. You tell us not to judge, and yet we want to criticize this preacher, that preacher, or the way that one dresses, or that mode of music, or we don't like this, don't like that. We've run here and yonder like little spoiled children, and the narcissism is evident. And it is sickening to you, our God. And so we humble ourselves. We repent as a Christian and as the church. And we pray and we seek your face. Now help us to get that fourth step down, turning from our wicked ways. Even in the midst of a, a, a global pandemic and a national emergency and multiple states in states of emergencies, I pray, oh God, your grace to be extended. I ask that you would intervene and just clear this up to where glory could not be given to scientific technologies or to any uh, uh, source other than a spiritual source. This is based, I believe, of all many things in a spiritual enemy. The devil uses bad things to get us even in worse condition. But God, you meet us during bad things that we could all be taken to a brighter and better result and destination. Just like those four leprous men got up from the place they were in. They couldn't go in the city. They were going to die there. They couldn't sit where they were. They were surely dying there. So they took the shot and went. And when they started walking, you started talking in power, scared the enemy to death. They fled in, in fear. And then your people got to fleeing in faith and the doubting politician got trampled underneath. God, the symbolic the symbolism that I think is truth running rampant over a lie. And I, may we never allow a lie to dominate the truth, but may we always be desirous that the truth would overcome a lie because we'll know the truth and the truth will make us free. So we are grateful for our liberty in Christ Jesus, Father, and we pray your comforting grace and love to be with every viewer tonight. Encourage them, my Father. Lift them up, overshadow them, surround them. Give us love that would love everybody. That's what you tell us, Lord, if we just love the ones we love. Everybody does that. But you tell us to love even the unlovable and to shine the light of your love to a lost and a dying world that's trapped in hatred and darkness. And so may love and light shine bright even through these moments. And we're believing you, God, for a swift 
uh, return to a similitude of normalcy, help the people that are worried financially, and God, people are still sick. We're still having funerals. In the midst of all of this, we're all doing the best we can to cope, and I pray we will do positive things. One of the greatest ways that you can bless us is when we bless others. So help your ministers, help your people. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus on this Easter, we glorify you, our God. And as you reach out to the lost, I pray many will be saved and that many of your people will just do what you've told us to do for so long, to humble, pray, seek your face, and turn from our wicked ways for the forgiveness of us and then the healing of our precious country. In Jesus' name. Thank you for watching tonight. Dear fellow pastor, let's do like those four old leprous men. Let's step out from where we've been. We're dying in this division, dying in this criticism, dying in this self-centered narcissism. I've been listening to some preachers lately, and I've just been talking to God for you, man. Uh, we've got to get to where God wants us to be not selfishly trying to rip control out of other people's hands. Let's just humble down and let God have his way. And if you're sitting there thinking I'm a wimp, well, that's your opinion. Old granny used to say that's your tail. I said on mine. I think it takes a bigger man to have meekness because meekness is not weakness. You're boisterous selfishness is not manliness. God speak to all of us. We need the church to have a revival. It's the hope of America and the hope of the world like it's always been. And one of these days, this whole world is going to be in a much, much, much worse shape. And we've got the mandate and mission from our blessed master Jesus to try to go out on a rescue mission to point as many to heaven as we possibly can so they, like us, can escape the wrath to come by running to the mercy and grace that's available today. That's what Easter's all about. So from all of us here at Freedom to all of you, blessed, happy Easter. He lives, and that's true 24-7, 365 days a year. Peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus from heaven. May it fill your hearts and bless you and yours through these days. We'll see you here this same time next week. Till then, may God bless you richly. Then may he use you for his glory and to be a real blessing to someone else.